What's up guys, this is Corey here with Toothless Reptiles in San Diego. Um, as always, make sure to follow us on social media. Uh, Instagram, we're like over 50,000 followers on Instagram now, which is awesome. Um, hit us up on YouTube, check out this video on YouTube, obviously. If you're watching it, you don't need to do that, you're already watching it. And um, check out our Twitter, and check out our Facebook. We also have some ads up right now for some Hep Black Dragons that are going to hatch probably in the next month, maybe month and a half. Um, so make sure you get in on those and enter the opportunity drawing as well. Um, so that'll be happening too. Come here. And um, make sure you're entered in for that. And if you don't want to donate the $25 to enter into the drawing, you can uh, make sure to comment on the post when the eggs hatch. Um, and you'll be automatically entered to win a free Het Black Dragon. Um, so I wanted to do another video. I've had a couple random questions here and there from people who want to breed monitors. And um, the, the biggest issue that I have with people that ask questions is they don't really know enough about it to ask specific questions. Um, so I'm going to give you just a basic rundown of what I do and my setups to breed water monitors and I've been pretty successful at it over the last 12 years coming up on 13 years now and um, this is just what I do so this may not work for you and especially if you're you know in Florida area and you're breeding outdoors you're really kind of at the mercy of the seasons so you can't um, do what I do here because what I do here is the monitors are on a uh, they're basically in breeding season year-round um, so hey, what are you doing? You can see Toothless walking around, being curious, wrecking everything like she always does. Um, so I set up my enclosures just like I talked about um, in my other videos with my setups. Is there, is there is a constant ambient of 85 degrees at least in all of the enclosures at all times. And the water is actually on a chiller. So there's a, everything that's on our pond system is all wired for 220 volts. So I have a water chiller that runs 24 hours a day on the pond, so the pond stays 76 degrees. So this is key, because if you're going to run an ambient in the 85s and not have a cool down period in the middle of the night, then you need to have a cold area for the monitors to go. And since they're water monitors, obviously, if you put a chiller on the pond water, they're going to be fine. They can go in and out of the water all day. Chances are they're going to be in the water all day anyway. Um, but then I also have basking spots that stay on 24-7 as well. So the reason that I do that is because water monitors in, in general, well specifically water monitors, are extremely active hunters in the morning. And this is because they hunt in the morning, they find food, they're opportunistic hunters, and they spend the rest of their day basking. And the basking definitely facilitates good digestion and killing bacteria. Well. I work full time and I know a lot of you guys work as well and we do this as a hobby but we need to adjust their environment for that so if you're going to feed your monitor later on in the day like what I do generally my monitors don't eat until 5 p.m. well say you're feeding your monitor at 5 p.m. and uh, you're shutting off their basking temps at night time well now your monitor's sitting with food in its stomach for 8 to 10 hours however long you have their basking spots off and it's just not good for them. So you need to keep that in mind. Either feed them in the morning or keep a basking temperature or basking spot on 24 seven, or you can make sure to keep it on on just the day that you feed them. Um, you can do other things, but that generally helps a lot with the breeding as well, because if you can keep a female and a male's metabolism going 24 hours a day, just biologically, they now feel comfortable enough to be able to support life. Um, water monitors have a enormous and enormous amount of control over their biological function. So anything with reproductivity, um, they can control 100%. So I've seen monitors that don't produce a lot of eggs, but are large monitors. Well, that's because usually they're either not in an enclosure large enough, they don't have a large enough water area, they're not being fed enough. So in their body, their body says, I can only sustain life for six babies or you know I uh, I only have enough space to be able to lay six eggs comfortably and um, a lot of that comes down to husbandry so 
Um, with our females, obviously, we end up with really big clutches, and it's because our, our enclosures are gigantic. And, you know, I've seen people have success with smaller enclosures, and you can have success with smaller enclosures, but that's kind of something we figured out along the way just because I'm not a minimalist type of guy. So if I'm going to do something, I go all out 100%. You know, if I decided to upgrade the filter system, I upgrade the filter system. So you can tell by looking at my system. So, you know, we figured that out as well. Um, so kind of got off topic for a second, but so basically all of my females are cycling year round and they'll cycle four, even five times in a year sometimes. And so when Yoshi's in a cycle and said, let's say um, I brought a new female in, which I just did. Generally, I will get that female in with a male just to expose her to the male, which will usually kick her into a cycle. Um, after that, I leave her be because I do not want her to fertilize a clutch. I want her to lay a clutch of infertile eggs so that way I can now start the timer from there. So generally when I bring in a new female, unless I've had lots of contact with the previous owner and I know that they've cycled a few times, I know what kind of enclosure they've been in, um, stuff like that. Um, but I will wait for that female to drop an infertile clutch. And then from that point, that's when I start my timer. So from the moment that a female drops her infertile clutch, I will usually wait two to three weeks before putting in a male. And this is specifically just because uh, there's a lot of stress involved with introducing a male into a female's area and you want to make sure that a female has not become protective over that area because she laid eggs in it. Which is another great idea that I had put out on my uh, lay box videos that if you're going to have a female and a male in the same enclosure, make sure that you have a lay box that you can remove from the enclosure because it removes the protectiveness over that space. So she'll be a lot less protective over that space if the lay box is completely gone because they don't always know that you pulled the eggs out. But if you remove the entire area, it's a lot better. So I will start to introduce a male. Now I'll introduce a male two to three weeks or whatever just to get her to start cycling. And as soon as I've done that, now I'll wait probably another week and I'll reintroduce a male for a few days. If they don't lock up, I'll pull the male back out because again, I'm trying not to stress out the female. So then I'll bring the male back in and if I get a good lockup and the time period seems okay, then um, I'll continue to let them breed for usually a week, maybe two weeks if I'm confident enough in, in the timing. And after that, um, generally it's about a month after conception if you have a good idea of when conception happened um, before they lay their eggs. So on average with Yoshi, because she's been laying eggs here for 13 years now, which is ridiculous, but she'll lay 28 clutches. So I'll have her lay a clutch. I'll bring a male in one month after that because I know her, t her cycle times. Generally within those first two weeks, maybe three weeks, um, she'll lock up. I'll leave that monitor, that male in with her until the two month mark from when she dropped her clutch. So there's a one month period in there where I have a male in there. I make sure that they've locked up. And then I know that she, everything's been fertilized and she, you can actually see because she has so many follicles, you can actually see the eggs move from her lower abdomen area all the way up into her oviducts because the eggs generally form as follicles down here and as they pass through into the two oviducts around the sides, that's when they become fertilized. Um, and as soon as I see that, if I notice that, like obviously I'll pull the male out. There's no need to have them in there anymore. Um, so once I know that she's moved all of her eggs in, I now know that, okay, it's about a month until she lays another eggs or lays her next clutch of eggs. So she can usually cycle between three, three and a half, four months. Um, sometimes I'll give her little breaks but generally that's what I do for timing with the monitors. Um, so this is what's weird that um, we've, we've, we've gathered a lot of data. I work really closely um, with a, a local vet, Dr. Dr. Jenkins at the um, Avian and Exotics Animal Hospital here in San Diego in Mission Valley. And we've done a lot of x-rays and a lot of research on these guys, um, especially the females because I take them in to keep track of their cycles. Toothless over here, 
she can push out follicles before they enter the oviducts. So um, if she goes into a cycle and there is no male around, she will abort the cycle and she will push out the follicles before they ever enter the oviduct, before she enters into a full cycle. She knows they're not going to get fertilized, so she releases the eggs. Um, which is something we figured out just from x-rays. We were keeping track of her follicle growth and then all of a sudden she just laid them all. And we obviously we knew that they had never entered the oviducts because we had been keeping track the whole time. But that's another reason why I introduce a male early on in the cycle, but I don't let them breed. Um, this is to kind of tell the female, hey, there's going to be a male around. So she'll actually create a lot more follicles and then she'll be receptive when I bring in another male and then she will go into an actual full cycle. Um, so it's really weird how they have, they literally have control over everything that they do, which is nuts. So I always try to bring a male in really early on right after they lay their eggs, but not so close to where you're stressing out the female. Um, to help get them into a full cycle so they develop a lot of follicles and then your timing needs to be pretty good with bringing your male in and having your female be receptive. Um, there's some other breeders out there who have another uh, have a lot of other cool techniques they use um, and they're they're really um, up to snuff with say like um, a behavioral habit that their female has and they know that um, two weeks after that she'll be receptive which um, Honestly, I've, I've never done it that way, so I have no idea if that's true or not. Um, but that's generally how I breed the water monitors. So you just need to make sure you have enough space. Generally have a lay box that you can remove from the area. Um, make sure your female and your male get along. If I have a female and a male that combat each other, I don't put them together to breed um, at all. I mean, that's kind of one of the, uh, the great things that I'm afforded because I don't do this as, for a living. So, you know, like these turds obviously get along, you know, which is fine. Um, what's really funny is they actually don't breed. So um, we're hoping that that changes this season, but um, they get along fine. They just don't breed. Huh, what are you doing? Oh, I know, I know. Um, so yeah, it's really weird. So we've caught on to a lot of cool little quirks and things that uh, the females do, but Generally, your female lays a clutch, introduce a male just to let her know that you're going to introduce a male within the first month, pull the male out, wait another couple weeks so you're about the month and a half marker, reintroduce a male. You can usually get your male and your female to lock up within those other two weeks. So you're now pushing out towards the two month mark from when she dropped her clutch. And then as soon as you've had a lockup, um, some people just wait for a single lockup and then they pull the mail out, which is totally fine. Um, I like to leave the mail in for a little longer. Just, that's just kind of how I do things. Um, keep in mind that if a male does have a successful lockup, that the sperm does stay viable in a monitor for, I mean, they say upwards of a week or so. Um, so if your timing is off a little bit, but you're sure that they locked up, you should still be able to hit your window, there's a fair amount of tolerance involved in there. Um, and then usually around the three month to three and a half month mark, she should be laying another clutch. So it just depends. Um, a lot of my females, they're, they're cycling all the time anyway. So, you know, it's uh, like if I give Yoshi a break, she still lays a clutch of slugs that's 20 eggs, you know, so I just kind of usually breed her. Um, that's kind of just how it ends up. You're gonna scratch the crap out of me. Here, come over here then. Here, come this way. Oh, uh, let go of my shoe. Uh, uh. Ow! Jeez. You could have gone the other way. Pain in the butt. But, <laughs> so, um, I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of an insight into how I breed the water monitors, but it is literally all about having logistics figured out, um, having the right setups, having compatible monitors, and then timing. Timing is everything. So I have calendars on the outside of all of my large enclosures 
and I write down everything on the calendar, and then um, I can go back and look, okay, she laid eggs on this day, and you know, it's been about two, three weeks. Um, otherwise, you end up trying to find pictures on your <laughs> pictures on your Instagram and stuff like that, and it's just a huge pain in the butt. But um, that's pretty much it. You know, it's really not that hard. Um, a lot of people, I think, uh, I think it's easy to get discouraged, um, especially with a lot of breeders not really wanting to give up information or not necessarily having the time to put out information or I think one of the biggest issues is that people don't know enough about it to be able to ask ask, ask specific questions um, which I know certainly the case for me in the beginning and I, I couldn't get a hold of anybody to talk to about it and um, I had a couple of decent resources but they weren't exactly monitor lizard experts so um, it was all trial and error in the beginning. So I've already done the labor pains for you guys. So that's why I'm eager to share all this stuff with you. Um, but hopefully, you know, we can all start breeding water monitors. Who doesn't want to have dinosaurs hatching in their house? You know, I mean, it's like the, it's the coolest thing. It's the most exciting part of breeding monitors is having your eggs hatch. Like when my eggs start hatching, like I literally don't sleep for like three days. Like it's ridiculous. So, um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. So just make sure you pair everything up and you have your cage requirements met. Um, if you're outdoors, it's a lot harder because you're obviously at the mercy of mother nature. So usually your breeding season is real small and it's, it's only around for a few months. And if it takes a couple months for your females to cycle, um, you're probably only going to get one clutch of eggs a year, but with our setups that we have, we can generally get quite a few clutches a year. And depending on, um, Toothless is an exception because she, she'll kick out, um, infertiles in less than two months if she wants. So it's really weird. So she kind of set her own standards around here, which, which is why we went the extra mile to find out exactly what was going on internally. And that's when we found out that she wasn't going into a full cycle. She was never pushing them into her ducks. She was just aborting the whole cycle, which was cool, you know. Um, but we got a new female, Valerion. Uh, she's actually breeding right now. So we're going to take her in for x-rays on Thursday. And we'll find out exactly where she's at in her cycle. But as always, keep feeding.